Praise God. Last weekend of the school holidays. Some people obviously taking advantage of that. Um, but let's turn to the word of God right now. Last week, I asked the question, um, what does the uh, resurrection of Christ mean to you? And I said, we really need to explore that. So I have been and I asked myself, what does the resurrection of Jesus mean for me? And so in a, in a style or a way that... Um, is a little bit different for me. I, I want to look at that. I want to talk about that a little bit more, the resurrection of Christ. And, and you might even be tempted right now to begin to switch off and think, well, yeah, we, we know about that. We believe in that. Yeah, it's no big deal. But I, I want to ask you, is it really a big deal or not for you? Um, I know it that uh, all of us would, have some level of understanding and, and some level of faith that yes Jesus was raised from the dead um, but but the truth is it's one of the core essentials of our faith and and there's only a few that I would say are absolutely essential uh, one of them would be that Jesus was God that Jesus was the son of God um, there was no an absolute essential uh, that Jesus was the son of man that he walked the earth as a man. He came and was born, he was a man. I think that's an essential. His death definitely is essential. But that the life that he lived was sinless, that's essential. But the resurrection, I mean, all these things aren't separate. They're all tied in together. But the resurrection for me is the pivotal thing that everything else hangs off. And I can't find the words to express how I feel or, or what I really mean when I say that but the resurrection of Christ is key it's essential it's it's the absolute pivotal truth that everything else uh, hangs off and and I know it deserves better and I know there's probably better words um, but I ain't got them right now okay but that's what I'm trying to say the resurrection is absolutely essential it's the core it's the pivot that everything works off and so if, I, if someone was to ask me, what does the resurrection mean? I'd have to confess that in probably the last few years, maybe a little bit um, far from, not far from my thinking, but not the focus of my thinking, but I think it should be continually and increasingly measured be the focus of all of our thinking. Um, his life was, came, he came, he came, he was deliberately, intentionally, purposefully sacrificed. The Father sacrificed him for the shedding of his blood would be the forgiveness for all mankind. That's another core. These things all work together, but the, the resurrection uh, is, is key. So here's the thing. I'm going to read a passage, a, f a very familiar passage. You know the story of Lazarus. And, but I... And I'm not even going to really focus on it. I'm just going to use it uh, to skim around and make some points. So in John 11:17 17 to 27, we, we read this. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Lazarus had been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women, uh, had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, I think we don't understand the significance of that <clears throat> because with, with the eldest brother dying, the situation for the two sisters was incredibly severe. Uh, and so it was a, an incredibly significant event, the loss of an older brother. But, but anyway, um, we'll, we'll keep on going, not to get too sidetracked. Uh, then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. And Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said, I want you to notice her faith. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. 
He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. So if you were asked, just randomly, family, friend, someone knew you, if you were asked, uh, why is the resurrection of Christ so important to you? What is it about the resurrection of Christ that, uh, what does that mean for you? Um, I wonder what your answer would be. I wonder how long you'd need to put an answer together. I, I wonder what we'd say. And, and perhaps even some of you are right now taking the challenge and you're preparing an answer in your mind right now. But I want to remind us in this moment, nothing new. Uh, I'm going to say everything you've heard before and believe in y- yourself. And, uh, but I do want to remind us and cause us to focus on why the resurrection is so important, okay? A little bit different, but, but here we go. See, Jesus' whole life without the resurrection would be re- relegated to an intellectual debate on morals when you think about it. His whole life. Everything he did, everything he said uh, w- would be reduced, relegated to debate on morals without the resurrection. That's all it would mean. His sacrifice, his suffering, his death, the cross would be meaningless without the resurrection. Waste of time. Even with his sacrifice, his suffering, his death, without the resurrection there would we there would have been no hope for us without the resurrection. No forgiveness of sin. No place with God throughout eternity without the resurrection. Let, let me remind you again of 1 Corinthians 15, 17 to 19. If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ... We are, of all men, the most pitiable. He's, uh, Paul, in that case, obviously, is addressing an issue that's arisen at the Corinthian church where they're saying that there is no resurrection. So Paul is just using his understanding, his logic, to point out the folly of that statement. And, and I can understand why that statement's being made. Uh, it, it's, it's being made by men very carnal they might be well educated but they're very carnal and and uh in their thinking in their processing there's no room for spiritual spirituality in their lives and so they're dealing with the resurrection because of that and so paul's correcting them without the resurrection all the promises of god would be null will be null and void having no force no pounding no binding power no validity without the resurrection. In our text, John 11, 25, 26, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Without the resurrection, what would any of his words be worth? And not just here, but everywhere. Without the resurrection, how could you put your confidence and your trust in in his word if there was no resurrection? Without the resurrection, sin and death would still reign over us. Romans 1, 3 and 4. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. His resurrection 
was the confirming act, was the evidence, was the proof of his power and authority. And his resurrection is actually the reason for all our hope. Without the resurrection, we have no hope. One Corinthians fifteen, going from fifty to fifty-eight. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery: we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. And the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible uh, must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall, uh, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the Lord. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. Everything pivots around his resurrection. The resurrection is the reasons, the reason uh, for our confidence in all his promises. I, wa I want to repeat something, a quote I found for Easter Sunday. And I really do need to get the name of the author. I'm sorry I haven't, uh, but I, I will quote him. If the death of Christ is the supreme demonstration of the love of God, the resurrection of Christ is the supreme dem demonstration of his power. The resurrection is the reason for our confidence in all these promises because he is powerful enough to keep them. 2 Corinthians 1.20 reminds us, For all the promises of God in him are yes and in him amen to the glory of God through us. His resurrection turned everything around and it becomes not about dying anymore but everything becomes about living. John 11, 25, 26, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Well, yes, we do believe it. It's got to be at the core. It's got to be at the essential element of everything we believe. It's all hinged on the resurrection. John 10.10, 10. the thief uh, does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. It's all about the resurrection brings in the focus. It's all about us living now and then, continual. It's all about us living. It's nothing about the death anymore. It's all about living. The truth is resurrection is about the power. And I'm not just talking about authority. The resurrection is about, about the power of forgiveness, the power of deliverance, the power of healing, the power of cleansing, the power of restoration, the power of transformation. And on top of that, the assurance of a place with God throughout eternity. That's the work of the resurrection. That's resurrection power right there. Let, let me list them again. Forgiveness, deliverance, healing, cleansing, restoration, transformation and an assurance of a place with God throughout eternity. That's resurrection power. Resurrection, the resurrection is the resurrection that gives us meaning and purpose. In Revelation 20 verse 6 we read this. Blessed and holy is he 
who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ. I shall reign with him a thousand years. Resurrection gives us meaning and purpose. If we really grasp what the resurrection of Christ is all about, no, it changes our lives. And, and here's something that I, that I uh, thought I, I had to put in because it's the resurrection that legitimizes the supernatural in our lives. I, I think the problem is We wrestle with the supernatural, our logic, our reason, our carnal, our carnal thinking, um, can't grasp the supernatural. And so because of that, we, we feel uncomfortable or even embarrassed or, or doubt-filled about the supernatural aspect of our faith. We feel so much more comfortable in the logic, rational, reasonable thinking. Uh, we, we feel so much better about it. The teaching of Christ and, and the gathering of information, the explanation that we discover in, in his word and, and what he's done. We, we feel all right. But when it comes to the supernatural, I think we're living in an age where, and it's changing dramatically, quickly right now, but I think we've, we've just come through a season where, probably several seasons, where we've discredited it a little or even distanced ourselves. We, we've tried, we've worked really hard, and, and especially in those times when we really need a supernatural, when we need something that's not natural, when we need... Um, God to do something, a miracle, something that's not natural, we'll push into the supernatural. Then, like, if there's an incurable disease, we'll believe God and pray and ask and keep asking. If is there some kind of serious problem that is way beyond us or above our ability or energy to to deal with, we look to God then for the supernatural. But but having the supernatural active in our lives and what that really means. I, th I think we've shied back from that. I think we've retreated a little bit, stepped back from that because, because again, the, the understanding, the, the reason, our logic, our rationale is, is based on natural things. So when we start to think about supernatural, we, we, we back off a bit unless our hearts are really motivated by a need that's breaking our hearts and we need so then we'll ask God for the soup but in the day to day you were around when when the Holy Spirit was poured out in a most unusual way in the um, late 80s early 90s and and even a little bit later in the in in the start of 2000 and uh, the division it caused in the church and even for Jane and I, we were ignorant of all that. And when it started in our church, at least we have the wisdom not to say anything or judge anything just yet. And I, I actually remember one night when, when we had a very unusual night in our church, when, when Jane actually got excited about dancing in church. I think I've told you this story. Uh, we were saved in Garden City Christian Church, which is a very conservative Pentecostal church. And uh, it was a big building and it was full and there was 2,000 people and the, the gaps between the pews were, weren't very big. But there was something about what God was doing in my life that made me very happy and excited. And so when the appropriate uh, worship came on or, or I felt the Holy Spirit move, I, I couldn't dance but I could bounce up and down. And, and, and Jane would be stood next to me and grab my trouser leg and try to keep me still and and then when I wouldn't when I tried it she'd pinch my leg or you know whatever she'd get a hold of and but then one night in Mariba we're having an evening service and um, in a school hall 
And there was a combination of a, 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 an altar call that was still going on and guys moving chairs at the same time because we had to pack up. When all of a sudden some very unusual things started happening on the altar. Uh, was people laughing that we didn't expect to laugh. And there was people crying who we didn't expect to cry. And then the boys from the youth group started crying and hugging each other. The girls got into a scrum and started laughing and fell on the floor. And as I look over the back, my wife's dancing. <laughs> like one of those uh, Spanish ladies with the castanitas, what they call the little... It's almost like a cross between the Irish river dance and that Spanish ladies doing the tapping, whatever that is. And I remember looking at her going, oh my goodness. And, and I, I caught her eye and she's staring at me while she's dancing and I'm going, what is going on? And she went, I don't know. But she kept going and she was set free that night. And the only words that she had in her head was... Um, Praise the Lord with your feet, which was a thing from DC Talk? No, no. Who? DC Talk and Carmen. It was the words from a song that DC Talk come. Praise the Lord with your feet. And that's what she was doing. So we had all those unusual things. But we, we didn't, we went home and we talked about it and we decided, let's just see what happens. Let's not talk about it. Let's not focus in on it as yet let's just keep praying and and we realize let's look at the fruit let's see what happens and sure enough people's lives were radically transformed and um, i was just speaking to a man in india actually uh who who got used in a big way in sydney and he was involved in the toronto airport church in canada uh where where this laughing thing broke out and he he's great testimonies but he he's kept in touch with those people and tells me the great works they're doing now the number of orphanages and refuge there are in southern american countries and even in africa it's just still to this day growing it's just amazing what they're doing and it was all birthed in that outpouring of the spirit and so um we gauge things by our fruit but at the same time there were so many who were, who were already um, uncomfortable with Pentecostalism. Uh, I can't remember that lifting your hands used to be an issue. Anybody remember those days? It was an argument whether we should lift our hands or not. What, really? I will argue about anything. If, if it starts heading towards the supernatural, because we feel very uncomfortable, we can't control it. We can't understand it. And so that's, I think that's the problem. There was all sorts of... It split the church. It really did split churches. Uh, and again, I believe because we, we weren't comfortable in the supernatural, but I want to tell you, I want to tell you that his resurrection, the resurrection of Christ, legitimizes the supernatural in our lives. Ephesians 2, uh, 4 to 7. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love and, and with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and in his kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. We're seated with Christ. Now, we can look at that and, and we rightly look at what it means with the authority that he's given us. Of, of Yeah, we're walking around the streets of Buna and Kalbar down here physically, but the reality is if we peeled back the, the facade of what's seen and unseen, if we if we looked into the spiritual dimensions, we have been seated or we have been given authority in Jesus' name. But with that comes all the supernatural, every aspect of the supernatural. You know, uh, we, we, we shy away from talking about 
the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit because we don't want to offend. We don't want to upset. We believe them, but we, we shy back a little bit when we're not in our own group because we don't want to offend people. Uh, even I've got to admit, even when I go to our unity prayer meetings, and because, you know, um, I'm not very good at praying because I pray. Here's, here's the thing that happens for me. When I'm praying, and, and I do get critical of others, I, I get angry with myself when I start to explain things to God. Now, I know God wants us to, because that helps us understand it. But when I know that God already knows, that's really not the way I should be praying. I, I, re, I remember listening to someone praying who... They started praying for a very real, genuine reason. And then they said, but God, this is what's really happening and this is why and this is what you need. And God went into details to explain to God the situation that was around this person's life. And, and I'm going, I think God might know that. What, why not? Is that real prayer or what? I, I remember one time we was at a big church meeting, a prayer meeting, and one lady got up and was praying about uh, another lady and and one of the pastors got up and asked her to sit down and be quiet I went what's going on there she says well she was actually gossiping she was letting everybody in the prayer meeting know that she knew what was really happening and she was praying in such a way where it looked like she was interceding but really she was just letting everybody know what this woman's doing and so he stood her down he just said please be quiet um, could you take the seat uh, greatly offended, but he was right. Um, again, we don't feel comfortable with the supernatural. Can't control it, don't really understand it. It's not logical. doesn't make sense. That's not the way I do it. So we shut it down. But the resurrection of Christ legitimizes the supernatural in our lives. We, we should be so enthused so passionate and zealous about the resurrection of Christ. And I'm sure there was a season where we all were, but we should be so enthused, so filled, so excited about this that the supernatural should be every part of our... It's like when we... I'm with Jane at places. We go out, and, and I'll, I'll give you an example. The other week, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we were having a scripture union meeting back there in the back room and um, a visitor, a guy who was part of the script union team was here and he just uh, said something and Jane immediately stopped and said, I really believe God wants us to pray about that right now and we prayed. And I know some of the people at the table were a little bit embarrassed. I was a little bit surprised and going, is this is appropriate? Of course it's appropriate. The guy's going through some major issues and he needs a supernatural to make a difference in his life and you know what he got it we found out a couple of months later that he actually got it he got the supernatural he needed but we're very don't want to offend don't want to upset don't want to shock i'm in the prayer meetings and my prayer goes like you know i'll just five ten minutes that's it i'm all out of words i pray in tongues because i know the holy spirit in me knows exactly what's going on and knows the right kind of prayer that's needed. And so I pray. But I go to these meetings and sometimes I'm like, I don't want to offend or upset. And, and you understand that I am trying to build unity so I don't want to chase everybody off. But I've been in those meetings. Even before the unity thing, I've been in those meetings and, you know, sometimes I get a little bit excited and people look at me so I back off. Because we're just uncomfortable with the supernatural. But the resurrection of Christ. <coughs> I'm seated in heavy places with him. In fact, I was supposed to write down a verse and I've forgotten to write it down. Did I? Ah, no, I didn't. Sorry. Actually, there's a few here. In Galatians 2.20, we read this. I have been crucified with Christ. 
It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I live in Christ now. I live in a resurrected Christ. I live in the resurrection power of Christ. In every single day. So to, to deny that resurrection power is to deny that the, the influence of Christ in my life and to back off or reverse, distance myself from it. Am I, am I presenting a good argument why resurrection of Christ is so important to me? It's everything. And, and I've got to learn, I've got to discipline myself. I'm not going to back off from it. So, if the Holy Spirit, which we pray all the time, for nearly 18 years we've been praying, Lord, we thank you that you're with us. Like in, even in this morning prayer, you know, we have a prayer meeting. Uh, starts about eight, but usually about quarter past eight to about quarter to nine. Um, some people used to come. But I'm always there. And so I'm praying and I pray for our worship team. I always start with the worship team. I thank God for them and ask God to use them and lead and guide them and let them become sensitive to the moving of the Holy Spirit so they can take risks and go beyond their experience, go beyond their practice and their training and, and take us into places we'd never been before in our worship. And then I said, oh, Lord, you please come. And I'm going, what is I actually said it out loud. What a stupid thing to pray. Because I know he's here already. I know he's, he's with me. He's in me. He'll never leave me. Why, why am I praying? Come. But, but you realize what, what I'm saying is help us to become aware of your presence and your activities. And so for 18 years we've been praying for more of the Holy Spirit. Well, we, we don't actually get more. But, but if he deals with us, he can increase in us. Does that make sense? It's not that he's limited, we're limiting. So if he does a work in us, opens. So 18 years we've been praying, Lord, in this moment, in this moment we call church, nine o'clock on a Sunday, in this time, in this moment, right here, I always pray that during the week I pray that, Lord, bring them in. Because you know, there's lots of distractions and deception out there, bring them in so they can come in. I always pray that during the week, but on Sundays I'm praying. Lord, you've got to be here. We want more. We need more. We're believing for manifestations of the Holy Spirit and his ministry and his gifts. I'm, it's, it's a growing thing. For 18 years, we've been praying and asking and expecting and we're seeing stuff happen. Every now and again, I, I think we get to the cusp. I think we get to the edge and I'm thinking, this is it, this is it. And then all of a sudden... I don't understand that. I don't think it's him. I think it's us. Maybe we don't want to be embarrassed. Maybe we're not sure. Maybe we're not confident. But hey, what can go wrong? The resurrection of Christ legitimizes the supernatural in our lives, whatever that is. And while I don't understand it, I'm not going to be frightened of it. <coughs> Jesus gave us the parable. He said, you know, if you've been a good, father, good parents, uh, know how to look after your kids well, how much do you think more God can do it? Like, you know, if you, if you ask for a, what did he say? If you ask for a stone, will he give you a fish and all that kind of stuff? And he said, this, some, this he said, talking about the Holy Spirit. And we're asking and, and he's giving. But we need a, a mind change. We need a renewing. We need a transformation. We need to have a bit of courage. Um, we're going to take communion now. And we know that this uh, reminds us of his death. But you can't separate it from the resurrection. It was a necessity for the resurrection. It was a necessity for the salva our salvation, the forgiveness of our sins. It was an absolute necessity that he went through this 
to get to the resurrection. Hmm. With the communion in our hand, what would you say about the resurrection? Would anybody like, while well, we've got communion in our hands, to share what resurrection means for them? I know. There's some incredibly skillful, well-educated, clever, intellectually clever people in our church, which is a stretch for me. It keeps me honest and makes me work harder in my preparation because I know there's so many smart people here. And they love me so much they're willing to let me know I'm wrong. Hmm. We've got successful business people. We've got people who've served in communities. We've got teachers. We've got all sorts. We've got nurses. Who was, at the, um, who was at the Australia Day breakfast? Who was moved by Evelyn's presentation? She's brilliant. Maybe Evelyn, you should take communion for us. I wouldn't force you to do anything like that. But if you wanted to, you could. Yeah. That's our new altar call. That's our new prayer verse, isn't it? Anybody? Who would like to share communion with us this morning? You know why we do this, don't you? Because a few years, many years ago, um, we were on a roll in the Holy Spirit and um, I was getting frustrated because we'd stop for an offering. We'd stop. And someone would teach or do a teaching on communion. But it kept stopping the meeting. It, it was like start, stop, start, stop. We just couldn't get in a flow. And so we started changing things. And one of them was the offering. I tried to do it with announcements. But people don't look at screens or read bulletins. So I had to keep doing it with announcements. <laughs> yes, that's true. I am having a little bit of shot of everybody. But uh, that's why we did it. And even communion now. We... We stopped doing it because it stopped, start, stop, stop. And, and we put it either in worship or where the Holy Spirit urges us or, or in our sermons now for the sake of continuity. If, if we want to create a place and a time where we give ourselves every opportunity for the Holy Spirit to come and minister, that's why we do this, right? That's why we do it this way. It's so appropriate right now. It would, is there anybody who would like to share communion for us? Okay. Because I told you there's so many clever intellectual people here, isn't it? Take that first film off. Let's get to the wafer. <coughs> wafer representing his body that was broken for us. The night he was betrayed, he did it with his disciples. We do it now uh, as a symbol of a very powerful act. Let's take the wafer to remind, remind ourselves that his body was broken for us.
Jesus shed the wine. We're sharing some juice. It represents the blood that was shed for us for the forgiveness of our sins. But let's drink it together. Major step. Because unless you die, you can't raise from the dead. That's why when the enemy killed Christ, thought he had his victory, was his biggest mistake. If he knew what God had in mind, he would never have got Christ on that cross. Because it's all about the resurrection power. And because Christ died on the cross, we can not just have that, entertain that, have that as a possibility, um, a resource that we can... Re we can live in that. We can live in resurrection power. I, I know too often we're more focused on our failures, our shortcomings, our weaknesses, our lack of education, all, all those other reasons, you know. Um, too often that gets the focus. We can live in resurrection power. Which means... It legitimizes the supernatural in each of our lives. No need to be embarrassed. No need to doubt. No, one, no need to be ashamed of it. Be because the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. What reference was that? Romans 8.11. That should have been in my message. Thanks, Robin. It is now. Yeah. You ready to pray? Shall we pray? Father, right now in this place, we're so grateful for your plan, the way you put it together, and the way you bring in revelation, understanding to its purpose, to its power. We thank you for the resurrection of Christ. We thank you for all that it means. We, we thank you not just for the intellectual aspect, but the power that's transforming our lives, the power to live. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that resurrection power, resurrection power will flow in us. That... Uh, the gateway of our mind will be opened and, and the Spirit will be able to fill our hearts and our lives day by day in the routine, in the daily challenges. All of a sudden, resurrection will become an, a major influence, either in motivation or in the power to change. Oh Lord, in this place right now, in this place right now. Come Holy Spirit. Hmm. I heard a wonderful definition of the Holy Spirit, a title of the... Of, and, and this person was explaining uh, the Holy Spirit, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit to a people who weren't familiar with Pentecostalism. And he said, basically... The Holy Spirit is Jesus everywhere. Sounds so simple, but it's so profound. Jesus everywhere. Lord, Holy Spirit, come. Be Jesus everywhere. In every life, in every heart, in every mind, in every situation, be Jesus everywhere. Come, Holy Spirit. And as Jesus went... He knew exactly what was going on and he knew how to respond. He either taught or he cast out demons or he healed or he brought revelation or he shared parables. Everywhere he went, he had incredible influence that changed situations. Be Jesus everywhere right now, Holy Spirit, in this place. I thank you that most of us, all of us, have been impacted 
and, and receive the Holy Spirit. But I pray for an increase now. I pray that the things that limit you in our lives will be pulled back. I pray and ask that the things that restrict, whether they be false teaching, wrong teaching, whether it be carnal understanding, carnal nature, whether it be embarrassment, I, I pray they will be lessened and he will be increased. Come Holy Spirit, that we might begin to really understand and to learn how to live in Christ, live in resurrection power.